Hi guys and welcome to the very first episode of Waze Wanderings. Today I'm going to review the Sony 24-70 F4 size for the Sony Alpha full frame system with real world photography and videos shot in South America. And it's through this I'll show you why it's one of the best, if not the best, travel lens for the Sony Alpha full frame system. The reason for this review is in part due to the history of this lens and because not everyone will be familiar, I'll be covering that first. And so you don't get bored, there'll be alpacas. I bought this lens back in 2014 when there were just a handful of lenses for the Sony Alpha system. Back then, if you wanted a native standard zoom, it was either this or the kit lens. The basic sentiment of the internet was overwhelmingly negative along the lines of this isn't a true size, the corners are rubbish, distortion is high, this should be a G lens, and then you have this quote from imagingresource.com stating that it didn't meet their expectations. Fast forward to today and the lens still not only has this general negative sentiment, but also has a ton of competition from the likes of the 24-70 f2.8 GM, the 24-105 f4G, and newer third party alternatives with competitive pricing. So how exactly does this lens stand up today in real world usage? Let's find out. In 2018, I went on an extended trip to South America and I ended up taking the 24-70 f4 size as a one lens setup. The decision was based on the lengthy duration of the trip and the fact that I'd be doing all kinds of activities from exploring urban environments to doing treks. The relatively small size, light weight and one of the most versatile ranges out there just played right into this nicely. So all the photos I show are gonna be from this South America trip, except where I've mentioned otherwise. The body I've used for all the photos shown in this video is the A7R2. All photos have been shot as raw and lightly edited in Lightroom since, you know, I just don't like buying expensive camera gear only to shoot in JPEG. So without further ado, let's move straight on to build quality. If you've ever placed your hands on one, you would notice that the lens looks and feels great. It's quite durable, but compared to say the 70 to 200 f4G, it's just not on the same level. The metal focus and zoom rings might look great initially, but they get blemished easily and look terrible after the paint has worn. My lens took several substantial bangs and held up okay in terms of functioning properly. It's bumped into the ground where I've braced its fall, it's hit rock somewhat lightly, my jaw not so lightly and it still works fine. My jaw still works fine too. Keep in mind it won't survive a proper hard hit like falling off your shoulder and banging into a gas cylinder on a trek. But don't expect any lens to survive that. This video on screen now is shot on an action camera. Shows you how I treat mine. I'm sure everyone else treats their gear better and if that's you too then I think you'll be fine. Waterproofing and water resistance is another hotly debated topic. Some people might straight up say this lens lacks proper weather sealing, there's no gaskets, blah blah blah. No, it doesn't have any gaskets, but its construction alone provides some weather resistance. Suffice to say, my experience includes shooting in light to medium rain, light hail, light snow, and even blizzard-like conditions. What's medium rain? Something like this. This particular photo was taken with the 16 to 35 f4 size. Uh, obviously it's a different lens, but uh, the build quality is practically identical. Ah, uh, that same 16 to 35 f4 size got splashed by seawater. I was just in the same area taking a photo, looking through the viewfinder and it just, it just whacked me out of nowhere. It's a giant wave. Uh, survived without a problem, you know, still taking photos straight after the wave hit. Uh, back to the 24 to 70. See those water jets? One spout shot water right onto my A7R2 with the 24 to 70 equipped. Uh, it survived. I was a bit scared at, at first, um, but it was still taking photos for the rest of the night. Um, you know, in terms of waterproofing or water resistance, that, that's pretty damn good to me. If the weather is worse than what I've just shown you, it's probably time to put the camera away, but it's not like you're gonna be taking photos anywhere. You're probably running for cover. Having said all of the above, of course, I did do diligent things like giving it a quick wipe with my t-shirt. You know, I did discover there was water visible on the mount 
uh, which likely leached in, but that's as far as it got. Back in my accommodation, I usually do a quick clean, but this time I did a more thorough clean and drying, which is, you know, it's just prudent if you're talking about something like seawater, regardless of weather sealing. Uh, I'm just going to quickly touch on flare. There's not much to be said here. Uh, it's controlled extremely well. The size T-Star coating is, is pretty amazing. Uh, you can shoot directly into the sun with very little repercussions. Uh, if I was to compare this lens to the 16 to 35 f4 size, uh, this lens performs way better, even though that has T-Star coating as well. I find stabilization pretty important while you're traveling. You know, you don't you don't always have the space to carry a, a big tripod around with you, and if you want to take a video while walking at the same time, uh, you'd be far better off with stabilization than without. Not all Sony lenses are stabilized since the newer bodies come with stabilizations in the bodies themselves. The Sony 24-70 f4 size is stabilized in the lens, whereas the f2.8 24-70s are not. Typically lens stabilization is better than in-body stabilization, especially at the telephoto end. This is why some lenses still have this feature, including the newer 24-105 f4 G. So while I don't carry a full-size tripod, I do carry with me a small gorilla pod. It's roughly 30 centimeters tall. Uh, you know, this is stuff for a more planned selfie or maybe a bit of astro. Uh, you know, just don't want to lug something around that's really big. Um, it's, it's really inconvenient and heavy, uh, and especially on a hike. Like, you know, who's, who's going to carry a tripod on a hike? With that in mind, you know, while stabilization will help your regular photos and videos, it's especially useful in doing, you know, cool things like uh, night photography or certain types of long exposure. When traveling, size and weight matters more than in other scenarios. Typically when you're traveling, or at least for me, you can spend most of the day and night exploring. This means carrying a camera for up to and over eight hours each day. Uh, you know, not just for one day either. Back to back days are common and even for weeks at a time if you're traveling, say, for two to three weeks total. A one kilogram setup, such as the 24-70 f4 size and the a7R2, could mean the world of a difference between feeling good or feeling terrible after a day's usage. You know, when comparing, comparing to a 1.5 kilogram setup, which, which basically any f2.8 zoom will put you at. How strong you are plays a large factor, but regardless, the lighter your setup and the more balanced, the longer you can go for. The longer you can go for without feeling less like a burden, the more enjoyable you're going to find photography. Keep in mind you're not just carrying your camera, you could be carrying other things such as food, water, clothing or other necessities. And if you're on a trek, that's a whole other issue. If you're an avid hiker and know all about trying to keep the pack weight down, this is no different. Another thing to take note of is that any travel that requires flights has a weight restriction. You're not going to want to put your valuable camera in check luggage, so you're really bound by the weight restriction of your carry-on. And that's even more so now, especially since that flights typically have a seven kilogram cabin baggage, some even going down to five. If you're lucky, there'll be a separate camera bag allowance. So coupled with other mandatory cabin baggage, such as your pile of NPW50 batteries, you're gonna find it hard to stay under the weight limit, especially if you wanna bring multiple lenses and other electronics like a laptop. Autofocus is fast and accurate. I want to show you a test since that just seems like a pain in the ass to set up. I also don't have the latest bodies with the best autofocus, so it wouldn't really be a fair comparison. With that said, my style of photography is heavily candid based, which requires fast and accurate autofocus to work. And this is achieved to my satisfaction on the A7R2. So as they say, proof is in the coconut. Or was it pudding? If you've read other reviews, you'd be aware that there's a lot of distortion with this lens. With distortion fixable so easily imposed these days, lens designers usually sacrifice edge quality to make the lens cheaper to design and build, and thus passing some of the savings onto you as a cheaper option. Keep in mind this distortion is automatically fixed in camera for JPEG and video if you haven't changed the camera settings. 
For RAW, it's by default removed in programs such as Lightroom. So is distortion still an issue these days? For my type of photography, not really, and you can probably even tell based on these photos shown in my video. However, there are some exceptions, such as if I was to heavily crop in, like with my wildlife pictures I'll show later, the loss of resolution can be noticeable. I also find selfies tend to look better without any distortion correction applied. Getting that background separation is what can easily separate your photos from everyone's run-of-the-mill camera phone photos. After all, why spend thousands of dollars on a camera or lens if your phone photos are going to look exactly the same? While not the sole reason, this is one of the main reasons people get an f2.8 or faster lens and shy away from any f4 lenses, especially for a standard zoom. Aside from the low light benefits and typically better quality, your photos will simply have a different look and feel just by simply shooting wide open at f2.8. That professional look, if you will. For an f4 lens, background separation will obviously not be as pronounced as an f2.8 lens or faster, but it's still possible. This is easier to achieve the closer you are to your subject and or using the longer range of your lens. The blur and bogeh can be quite pleasing. However, quoting the official Sony website, this lens has a circular seven blade aperture for beautiful defocus effects. The reality is that seven blades is not nearly enough to make a perfect circle, even wide open at f4. And you have to remember with this being an f4 lens, the size of the circles is small. One thing I noticed, that was with high contrast lighting such as harsh sunlight and tree leaves, it can look a bit busy. But just make sure your subject is attractive and nobody will looking at your specular highlights. However, you don't need to completely blur away the background to get great looking photos. If you know that your lens can't blur the background so well, use it to your advantage. What does that mean exactly? Well, just show an interesting background. Make seeing the background better than not seeing the background. This is my friend Kat in front of Glacier Grey in Torres del Paine. This has very minimal background separation, but it's one of my favorite photos. It's also shot at f6.3. Another one of my favorite photos of the small amount of background separation. Here's Cat again, but at dawn. Now this photo has more background separation than the previous two by simply being zoomed in more and with the aperture opened up slightly, but still less than f4, but not so much that you can't make out the impressive mountain in the background. So to sum up this section, while faster lenses can do it better and more easily, you don't always have to blur everything out, and as demonstrated, you can still get that coveted background blur if you so choose, and plan accordingly. It just gives your travel photos that much more oomph. Sharpness is probably one of the most criticized aspects of a lens these days. It's not because sharpness is the most important aspect of a photo, it's simply because it's one of the most easily identifiable characteristics of a lens by basically anyone. With that said, how sharp is this lens? I'll let you decide. And in case you couldn't decide, the center is pretty tack sharp even for f4, if you want it even sharper, just stop down to 5.6. Ah, the corners, one of the biggest reasons people hate this lens. I don't shoot brick walls or charts, which are basically just glorified brick walls. If you've looked at my photos, you'll soon realize that the corners don't matter in real world photography. There's really nothing interesting in the corners. It's either already blurred out as foreground or background. There's never a subject in there, or there's just something totally uninteresting, in which case blurring it out it doesn't hurt at all. I'll throw in a few extra landscapes because that's where people say it tends to matter most. Even if the corners are slightly blurry, who is actually going to notice? You might notice it in your own photos, but that's just a pink elephant issue. Take a photo of someone, they're not complaining about the corners. They're saying stop taking photos of my ass. So aside from getting slapped in the face, when might it be an issue? If I was looking at a stitch panorama zooming one to one, then yeah, I'd notice some awkward stitching where sharp meets blurry, but when will that actually ever be an issue? Take this photo for example, it's stitched, but is there a border where blur meets sharp? If I don't zoom in or don't tell you, would you ever know? And what if I told you I took this photo while this lens had a broken lens mount, which created an even more terrible edge in corners? 
If you're a pixel peeper and you love your perfect corners, you know, you're probably going to hate this lens. But if you haven't figured it out already, you know, that's not what this review is about. Okay, I want to talk specifically about hiking and trekking. Details are probably something for another video, but there's a few things I want to point out here. If you're thinking of taking a camera on a hike, it's pretty important to have a lightweight and compact setup, especially if you're going to be at it for a while. Space is very limited and as is how is many kilograms you can afford to carry. Any lens you don't end up using just serves that extra weight you have to carry and every gram counts. Where you have your camera is another factor. Is it easily accessible or do you have to take off your whole pack to take your camera out whenever you want to take a photo? Again, where your camera is stored is usually based on how small it is and how much it weighs. While traveling, there's endless opportunities for street photography. And having the 24 to 70 f4 size is perfect for this. This is even truer depending on where you are in the world and the size of your street photography balls on a scale of 1 to Kai. You can't always walk where you want to go. Wide angle lenses let you capture the whole thing. The relatively small size and zooms allows you to stay stealth without incurring a negative Uber rating. In certain countries, it can be common for people to ask you for money if you take photos of them. So zooming in allows you to take photos without having to tip. Zooming in also allows you to take photos without getting invited to some kind of weird party. But most of all, you don't want your camera to get damaged or confiscated. Combining this lens with a high performance body will allow you to get some great nighttime shots, no matter where you are in the world. While yes, switching to a faster prime is better, but do you actually need to? In a non-well-lit cave, such as one where you need a torch to navigate, you're probably going to get really noisy photos from shooting at high ISO. How noisy is acceptable? For travel photos, this is really a personal preference. The lighter and more balanced your setup is, the easier it is for you to do these flowy water handheld shots. And that's just going to separate your photo from everyone's quick travel snap. If you're wandering the streets of La Paz and don't get mugged, these are the type of photos you can walk away with. For wildlife, one of the main challenges of the 24-70 f4 size is reach. How far does a maximum focal length of 70mm get you? In terms of birding and monkeying, don't be surprised if you get a lot of photos that look a little something like this. Unless of course you jerry-rig your camera to a scope. With the 24-70 f4 size, you typically have to be very close to get a really dynamic looking photo. While not impossible with real wild animals, it's gonna likely happen with tamer creatures or insects. If you have a higher resolution body like the a7R series, then you can crop in quite significantly and effectively too. If you simply want a photo of the creature, then the 24-70 f4 size will suffice. And with a bit of patience and luck, you might actually walk away with some nice shots. A large factor in your purchasing decision is price. I'll just throw them up on the screen, save having to read them all out. I won't turn this video into a 24 to 70 comparison, but it's good to know what the alternatives cost, since most people will probably only ever buy one. Uh, you can get the 24 to 105 F4G, but it's going to cost you around 40% more. Want the GM, you know, it's more than double. That's a kidney to some people. To others that get sucked in by dodgy salesmen, the extra amount is the, only the low, low price of a cup of coffee per day for one year and one month. If you want to upgrade your kit lens or don't have a zoom at all, uh, this lens is actually the cheapest of the bunch. What does look highly competitive is the Sigma 24-70 f2.8 at just 23% more. But you know, that's significantly larger and heavier. I don't know if it would have worked as well as the 24-70 f4 size, especially in things like hiking. Worth mentioning, Sigma has just released a 28-70 f2.8. Uh, it's a little shorter on the wide end, which, you know, I really don't like, especially for travel photos. The vast majority of the time, you're probably going to be shooting wide open to capture scenery and architecture. Sacrificing there is, I don't know, it's just, it's just not, it's just not me. And there you have it. It's been one long journey and the 24-70 f4 size 
is one hell of a lens for travel. This lens for your full frame Sony Alpha system has amazing real world image quality. Combine that with its 24 to 70 zoom range and you have one very nice offering in a relatively small and lightweight weather resistant package. While it does have some shortcomings, its overall versatility shines through. As I've shown, you can take this lens literally anywhere on your travels and come out with some great shots. To remind you, this video isn't just about this lens first that lens. Sure they'll be better, but sure they'll be worse. This video is just to show you how the 24-70 f4 size performs in the real world and I hope I've done just that. If you want to check out more photos from this lens, check out my blog at wagerland.com, link in the description below. On top of that, I still have a ton of photos from this lens just sitting around, which I might include in a future video if people are interested in this style. Do you own this lens? Do you think it's good or rubbish? Let me know in the comments below. If you want to see more videos, be sure to like and subscribe. And I also just started a Patreon for those interested. So get out there and take more real world photography. See you next time.